Hello everybody, my name is Rachel McIntyre. I am an architect and sustainability lead and I'm currently teaching at the School of Architecture and Future Environments at Auckland University of Technology. I have over 20 years of international experience and for the last 10 years I've worked in Copenhagen, Denmark, mainly working with retrofits of cooperative housing associations. Today I will be sharing some alternative housing cases which are in their infancy in New Zealand. All these models prioritise community and the collective well-being over profit and wealth creation and aim to add diversity to the housing ecosystem. They also make a contribution to a livable city. I would like to like to discuss how a more diverse housing ecosystem can help with the current housing crisis here in Aotearoa and hopefully inspire others in dealing with similar housing issues elsewhere. I will briefly introduce the housing and cultural context in Aotearoa, New Zealand look at ideas around socially based tenure and a social mortgage, and then introduce three cases from Auckland, alternative housing cases, and then ask the question of why we need to diversify the housing ecosystem, and then look at potential opportunity and the idea of a paradigm shift. Housing in New Zealand has largely been commodified. It is viewed as a way to build wealth with negative consequences for the majority of low to moderate income earners. Buildings have traditionally been our biggest investments and we have an obsession with getting on the property ladder and then moving up the property ladder as we go through life. Individual wealth is built on home ownership and is a key component of the New Zealand economy. There is a limited diversity of housing choices. One has the choice of buying or renting. And if you're in an emergency situation, you may have access to social housing. So most people are basically stuck with the market. Also, the quality of housing is generally poor and the buildings have a shelf life of less than 50 years. Our building code is considered to be below international standards, though there is a long overdue, overdue um, overhaul coming up next year as we look to be zero carbon by 2050. New Zealand has historically benefited from plenty of land and low population density with a single standalone family home and a large garden being the New Zealand dream. Our cities are traditionally suburban with urban sprawl and are very much car focused. This model is obviously problematic today as we try to create denser and more livable cities. New Zealand has traditionally had two main cultures, the Maori being the indigenous people of New Zealand and the Europeans being the colonizers. And today I'll talk about iwi, which are a political Maori grouping and are a tribal grouping financially and culturally. Iwi could be considered like huge families with many layers and clans or descent groups or hapu, and they all have obligations to the wider iwi. And over time, iwi and hapu have regained some of their ancestral land through hard fought legal battles. And Maori culture and ways of living are generally more intergenerational than Western ways of living. And before colonization, Maori, communi Maori lived communally in family and hapu groups. Currently, New Zealand has the perfect storm around housing with severe affordability issues and supply issues. There has been a lack of uh, positive or incentivized um, government intervention since the 1990s. As we can see in this chart, uh, we will see the capital assistance drop off from 1990 on onwards and this has an effect on affordable new builds and the quantity being built. 
There is also a growing concentration of multiple home ownership, which is increasing the levels of inequality. And there is an increasing um, percentage of people renting. And in New Zealand, uh, the laws are generally skewed, the rental laws are generally skewed towards, uh, to favour the landlord. Every urban housing market in New Zealand is considered severely unaffordable now, but when you look specifically at Auckland, the median house price is 10 times the average annual income. And we've seen a 20% rise in house prices in Auckland alone, and this is just in 2020 and during the COVID pandemic. Given the housing crisis in New Zealand, it is worth considering the range of alternative models of governance, ownership and management in housing development. And there are many different ways of developing um, and development and ownership models that promote a more equitable and sustainable way of living. Generally in New Zealand, most development happens on the left side of the spectrum where we have uh, developments being delivered by developers and poor residents. These are speculative market-led homes for residents and these are profit-driven. And when we talk about diversifying the ecosystem, we need to be looking in the central part of the spectrum. Um, and these are models which are categorised by increased resident participation, limited profit, increased affordability and better design. Today I will introduce a socially equitable build to rent a resident-led co-housing project, and a papakainga, which is a Māori ward for a housing development for Māori people on their ancestral land. All of these cases I am introducing today incorporate the idea of socially-based tenure and a social mortgage. Socially-based tenure is an ownership model based on social norms, processes and relationships. And socially based tenure feature many, um, is a feature of many indigenous cultures where land and resources are managed from a collective rather than an individual standpoint. And it allows for a more holistic approach to the way communities can develop housing. And one way of introducing uh, socially based tenure is to introduce this idea of a social mortgage. So this means there is a social component to the property rights which binds the communities together, meaning the property can be about more than just the financial bottom line, but it can also be about the environmental, the social and the cultural bottom lines, which are just as important. The three cases I'm introducing respond in different and positive ways uh, for the need for diversity in the housing ecosystem in Auckland. And they're three cases that measure success through social health, well-being and governance rather than capital gain. The first case is 26 Aroha. The second is Co-House. And the third is Kayanga Tuatahi, the Papa Kayanga. All of these are loca located on the city fringe or the inner suburbs of Auckland and the red dot being the central business district of Auckland. 26 Aroha, the socially equitable bill to rent, is a response to the current rental market which is very insecure, expensive and generally has a lack of regulation. This solution is bringing long-term rental to the market, encouraging a 10-year lease and encouraging building of community and resident wellbeing. It is a really good example of quality medium density housing in a typical Auckland suburban neighbourhood, where the original streetscape was single family homes. And over time, these have had uh, infill properties built on them. So generally, all the properties around Aroha have two houses on them. Aroha has produced 13 high quality units with varied sizes and with a lot of shared amenities. 
and the density has increased from 11 dwellings per hectare to a very impressive 143 dwellings per hectare. The owners have incorporated all the best local and international examples to create a housing form common in Europe. They've drawn inspiration from the likes of the building, the Living Building Challenge, um, co-housing, cooperatives and Baugruppen. And they purposely put the building near uh, transport hubs and they provide for bicycle parking, shared electric cars and have minimised uh, car parking. Aroha has a unusual financial model for a New Zealand rental. The landlord developers have waived the usual 20% profit on completion and allowed for a lower initial developer profit of, um, based on a strong 20 year forecast that showed good returns and reliable debt reduction for the owners. Aroha has a lot of socially and environmentally sustainable uh, features and the focus on the shared amenities to create community um, are apparent. And you have to remember that this idea around shared amenities have long been the norm in other countries, but they're fairly new to the medium to higher density living situation in New Zealand. And one of the shared amenities I'd like to highlight is the common laundry on the roof terrace, uh, where they've incorporated a kitchen and a dining lounge area, and then this roof terrace, which has fantastic views over the surrounding suburbs and over Auckland. So you have to, you know, you have to go up to do your laundry, and you have a reason to go up to the roof space, and this has become a real social hub for the building where you can invite guests and meet your neighbours. Um, the next project is Cohouse, which is the first fully urban co-housing development in Auckland. And it, set, and it is setting a very important precedent for future medium density and co-housing projects. Co-housing is in its infancy in New Zealand. Um, but there is a lot more interest and developments beginning to pop up around the country. Cohouse is a hard one response to the current lack of diversity in the housing market. And they have created uh, two to three storey buildings and have managed to keep the original villa, which they have placed on the corner of the property. They've created 20 units from one to five bedrooms. And they've increased the density from four to 80 dwellings per hectare. So again, a really good example of quality, medium density housing and how you can do it well. The project is resident led. The lead family are the architect developers and therefore cut the developer margin out of the project. It is an example of community focused housing which priority prioritises community creation again. And again, the shared facilities are key for the success of the project. It will have landscape gardens, a common house, guest flat, cycle, cycle storage, shared cars, and the common laundry to name a few. And they have also collectivised the maintenance, which is also a feature of all of these three cases I'm introducing today. Cohouse will also provide for intergenerational living and support, which New Zealand housing uh, developments or houses do not generally allow for. So the dominant model of retail bank funding is high is considered high risk for community focused housing. Um, because the banks do not place value on social capital and the common shared facilities are not valued highly enough. Cohouse succeeded because the two lead families were able to resource the initial phase and assume all the risk, which is very unusual. And this development provides housing security for the residents and has a long-term focus. The next case is a papakainga, 
uh, which can be described as the ancestral home of a Maori kinship group. Traditional kāinga consist of multiple dwellings centred around a marae or meeting place or place of significance. Residents connected to each other and the land through common genealogy. And the Ngāti Whātua of Auraki, which is the hapu here, can be described as a social corporate entity based on kinship. Again, the papakainga has similarities to co-housing, but it is iwi or hapu or family-led. Kainga tuatahi is a response of the hapu who own the land collectively, wanting to house and provide for their people and have them return to their ancestral land. It is the first go at developing quality, medium density housing, which meets their cultural values. They managed to build 30 high quality, affordable townhouses, two to five bedrooms, open plan living, and allowing for larger extended families to live there and intergenerational living. They've also built in flexibility where the garage in each property could be converted into a granny flat or a shared bedroom or workspace and the shared amenities are generally shared outdoor spaces which allow for community gatherings for play and there's a communal vegetable garden for example this project was completed um, with a very good time frame of three years and has a lot of uh, good sustainability features And again, due to barriers in the existing financial system, the hapu have had to act for the first time as both developer and bank, providing mortgages to purchasers. So the purchasers had to come with a minimum of a 5% to deposit. And 65% of the people who ended up purchasing these homes were first-time home buyers or young families. This is uh, individual titles on collectively owned land, meaning the price of the houses could be kept down and buyers are only paying for the building costs. So they separated the land from the houses and the pricing. And the pricing is somewhat regulated. And this is stage one of an ambitious long-term plan um, where the Ngāti Whātua Auraki believe that or hope that one day they will provide enough housing for 3,000 people and the next stage they are for the next stage they are looking for different models or ownership models um, rentals long-term lease and also looking at higher density uh, models so the question stands why do we need to diversify the housing ecosystem People want to do things differently, even though they face many hurdles, financially, legally, and consenting hurdles. And the traditional profit-driven development model favours standardisation over quality and uniqueness. Alternative developments are more difficult to achieve because of their social complexity, but once developed, they make a good contribution to the local community and resident wellbeing. And they also provide intergenerational living arrangements and allow for the community to provide for future generations rather than short-term profit. So what we really need is a paradigm shift to tackle our housing challenges, a paradigm shift in the way we think, build and live. And we must become accustomed to higher density living, creating community as we go, and focus on creating livable cities, avoiding urban sprawl. Alternative and community-focused models offer an opportunity to rethink how we deal with some of the key housing challenges and provide the opportunity to stop talking home ownership and start talking secure and affordable housing. They can provide residents with a sense of agency and autonomy over their housing future. And this can only help in the sense of well-being in a community. 
We can introduce the ideas of a social mortgage and socially based tenure where the real value of dwelling is social, environmental and cultural combined with the financial bottom line. And we need to redefine how we think about space, focus on less private space and more communal space and think about how this can be owned in a more collective way. And there is an obvious need for financial systems um, to be addressed and adjusted to meet the needs of alternative housing models. We also need to incorporate regenerative systems thinking and indigenous ways of thinking, key, um, being key to future developments and where the entire life cycle of the planet and people are considered. I would like to say thank you for listening today and thank you to the Public Housing Forum International for inviting me to speak today and especially a huge thanks to all the people and companies that helped get this talk together. Thank you.